All right, boys. Enough of this nonsense. Let's jump right in. Do it. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Fair Chase podcast. Um, we're in the middle of, I guess you could say it's a series, um, almost unplanned, but kind of planned. Um, it's summer. Actually, Jared and I just got back from TAC, which means we're thinking about arrows because Jared probably lost half a dozen. Uh, Why don't you tell everybody who beat you? Uh, I will say me and Jared had a competition. Uh, he beat me by three, which means I owe him uh, mm. a tin of dip. Yep. I owe him a four pack of his fancy craft beer. Yep. And one favor, which is favor. Uh, which is the really the kicker. It's a big um, deal. So a favor can be, man, it can be just a favor. Like, hey, man. I need you to go pull the canoes up because we're done. And it might be raining out, you know, like, all right, I'm going to burn a favor on that. Or what was another good one? Um, Like, or it's like, sometimes you'll be like in in the tent or something. It's like, oh, I left something outside. I have to go get it. Like, hey, man, I'm using a favor for it. And you're already tucked down in. Yeah. Like, really don't want to get out there and put my boots back on. I'm going to burn a favor. That's (laughs) the favor here. That's the most um, painful part of losing the bet, actually. Um, but on top of that, we had a, a side bet where we pointed out the 17th target <laughs> and said, all right, whoever shoots best on this target, this is like a, an extra favor, uh, mm-hmm. a favor hole, we kept calling it, which uh, <laughs> didn't sound really right with the guys we were with. <laughs> no. And so. Holes. It was funny because at first we shot and like every single time we did it, it was super close. Like the first time I think, did you win the first one? Or no, no I lost the first one. You lost the first one. I won it, but I wanted to do double or nothing. I wanted to double nothing. or nothing. Yeah. And so we tried to double up or nothing and it ended up being, I lost that one. Well, that was, you... that was, that, that was the 17th target, which was a 62 yard shot kind of across a draw. Yeah. And you had to shoot through like the Y of this tree, probably 35, 40 yards out. Yeah. Big window to get through. Yeah. And it was a bedded ram, I believe. Yeah. So real low vitals. And Jimmy shot high. I shot, I shot over shot his back. back. Yep. You spined him, didn't you? Uh, it's still hit five. You killed him. You got points. And that was really all that came down to. We did triple or nothing. And then you won by a Jared hair. Like uh, just. Hair. That was on the turkey. Yeah. Uphill. I should have known. Yards, 50 yards. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good shot. So all that to say is um we had a good time at tack. I'm wearing my shirt. Wow. Yeah. I want people to know I deal in dirt. You naps. Thousands of others. Yeah. Instant, instant tack. What's up? We are gonna thank a few of these sponsors that help make this beautiful show a reality for all of you. So yeah. here we go. So, so a big reason. I would say to why we're so successful and we have so many bucks on the wall is because we use HuntWise. Uh, HuntWise is a GPS mapping app that you can download on any phone, any platform. You can look up public land hunting's ORV trails. You can get the weather. They actually have a, a HuntCast 2.0 that they teamed up with Jeff Sturgis to make. It's awesome. You need to check this thing out. Go to HuntWise, download the app. I feel like if you go into the woods without optics, it's like going into the woods without pants on. Would you agree with that? To a point. To a point. Uh, we are huge fans of running uh, binoculars, uh, spotting scopes, and different things when we hunt, uh, even whitetail. Uh, I bring binoculars out every, every time I go. Uh, we choose Vortex Optics because they make the best glass in the business. They have an amazing warranty, uh, super clear glass, super helpful people that work cool. there. Also, if you want to rep some sweet Vortex swag like this warm shirt on a nice fall day, head over to Vortex Wear. Thank you. And use the promo code TFC24, 20% off your purchase. Saddle game, you need to be in it. If you haven't been in it yet, then you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. Trophy Line Tree Sales makes some of the best saddles in the industry. They have three different platforms that we use and that are awesome. I want to make a quick plug for the wingman with a couple steps. You can take one last step, uh, stick, and it's like a combination of a stick and a platform. I've been exclusively hunting out of it this year, and my mobile setup is so sweet. I'm very proud of it. Awesome. I highly recommend awesome. the Wingman. If, you are, if you're ready to pull the trigger on that and you want to get with James and do the Wingman, 
head over to their website and you can save yourself 10% on the purchase. TFC 10 will get you that. I like to think I single-handedly got James to switch to compound again, but I'd probably be a liar and everyone would call me out on that. Um, we shoot prime bows. We think they're awesome. Great accuracy, super shootable. Uh, made here in Michigan. Made in Michigan, so we love that. It's hard to complain. That's where Jared was made. So Surprisingly. We like that. Yeah. Welcome. So go check out these prime bows. We are of a firm belief that – the arrow is the lifeblood of the, the archery, archery industry. industry. We've said it a thousand times. Uh, but in all seriousness, we are huge fans of arrows that are durable, um, that sh fly well, and that kind of make up for some of my inaccuracies in the way that I shoot. So we shoot vector the, custom arrows. The hammer. The hammer. <laughs> That's um, Thor. That Thor would say. They are made in Wisconsin uh, by our buddy Isaac. Uh, great arrows. Uh, and if you want to go and get yourself some, have a little bit of a discount, use TFC10 for 10% off. Or call Isaac up and tell him we sent you. Mm -hmm. You want his phone number? Comment below. Yep, comment below. So anyways, um, but part of that is, you know, when you go to the tack, you see people, there's just arrows everywhere. And, and a big thing uh, that people are talking about are arrow setups. What's your setup? What are you running? What do you set up? What you're running? Mm -hmm. right, what are you running in the hunting industry can really mean anything. Uh, what are you running? Uh, that could be trail cameras. That could be what bow are you running? Cam mm -hmm. Running as a word that applies <laughs> to anything. <laughs> and especially if you're, you know, as they say, a dirt nap dealer. So anyways, one of the things people are talking about running are arrows. And so last week we had the ranch ferry on, um, who came in and, uh, gave us a very, uh, fun take on arrows. You know, he's a, he's a fun guy. Uh, he's got a strong opinion and he rubs a lot of people the wrong way. A lot of people love him. Um, but um, to kind of follow that up, we, we thought it would be wrong to, to leave it there. Uh, and so today, this is the longest intro we've ever done. I, I think for, for somebody today, we good. Decide, is good. it good? Welcome to this journey. I've hooked, if I hooked you, uh, today we decided, all right, you know, we, we, we do, we kind of subscribe to something kind of like what, what the ranch fairy, I feel weird saying that, uh, does, but a little different. Um, and, and we decided maybe today we have Ben, uh, from, from vector custom arrows, come on and just kind of give his approach to arrows. So before we jump into that, Ben, do you want to just say who you are and, and what you do? Sure. My name's Ben. I'm with vector arrows. They're based out of Wisconsin and I pretty much head up the research development and design as well as most of the information technology going on over there. So if you've ever been to our site, you see the arrow calculators pretty much what comes out of there is what we put into it. And our design philosophy is not so much based on what arrows we can give you. It's really the other way around where we only give you arrows that seem to really make sense and are pretty reasonable. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, wait a minute, Ben, what shirt are you wearing? We got tack from last year. Ah, Ooh, I almost yeah. put that one on. Just I love vintage. it. So matching t-shirts. So not, close. Not going to ask <laughs> what I'm wearing. Now, what are you wearing? Jerry? Oh yeah. Sorry. What are All you right, wearing? Jerry? Brace yourself for this one. Right. Only yeah, a few of you will get it. Tuck coming. Tuck coming, baby. I don't know what that means. Don't worry. The tuck rule? If you know, you know. Should I know? Oh, tuck's I don't coming. know. It's all right. Michigan, ham, Go green. blue state. What? I don't like Michigan State. Um, that's too long to really read. likes Michigan. Let's go. It basically, it means that Tucker's success is coming. Tuck is coming. It's uh, some sort of coach. Some sort of coach. I'm an yes. NFL man. so Unbelievable, uh, this guy. Yeah, we'll see. I thought they were Michigan's little brother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude has never watched a college football game in his life. I'm an NFL man. Why watch the beat league? There's no home runs in football. I'm a, I'm a big Bears fan. I've been this whole point of this podcast, and I've said it from the beginning, is to figure out a way to get Jay Cutler, the greatest quarterback of all time, to join this podcast. Dude, I, was raised, getting, getting, I, was, I was raised a Bears fan, and I don't know if I'd go that far. Dude, Jay See? Cutler, the golden arm, golden boy of Chicago, best buns in the NFL. You saw that picture. <laughs> America's ass. That's America's ass. <laughs> yeah. All right. At least you know we have standards. Guys, we're getting off track. Uh, ben, dive into a little bit about your approach to, to arrows, tuning, and, and you know how this stuff works. Sure. So the big thing that we 
our kind of our shtick is we can take your specs out of your bow. And if your bow is properly tuned and properly set up, meaning a sufficiently stiff arrow is leaving perfectly square to your riser and is accounting for grip torque and all that sort of stuff, that a sufficiently spined arrow will fly well. And that's a pretty easy to prove premise. I mean, if you go take a bow, you tune it, you put a good arrow in it and you send it. Yeah. You can go take a similarly spined arrow, regardless of weight, via a spine chart, because they've been right for a long time, and send the same one. And you're going to have fairly fairly similar flight characteristics. You're going to have a little bit of difference because you're doing different things to it, but it's all stuff that can be cleaned up with a bump of your rest a little bit away. Either way, assuming your form's good, your tune's good, and everything else downstream is correct. So we agree that you need a durable front end component. Mm-hmm. You need carbon that's not going to break. You need enough weight up front that your spine's broken down sufficiently, but not so much that you're going to tune weak. Yeah. Then on the back side, you need enough vein to allow for optimal stabilization, but not so much you get excess drag. You need a knock that's high quality. Is it going to be brittle? Is it going to be too um, pliable and break apart? And is it going to be too tight or too loose on your string? So the entire system has to work together. Yeah, like even a knock, knock a pinched knock. My brain I, is completely on fire right now. Yeah, well, I'm you got Steve. one of those brainstorms again. Holy smokes. You're going to have to go lay down. <laughs> that's a lot of information, Ben. That's uh, how many... I mean, what type of thinking goes into, obviously a lot of it goes into it, but like who, who had this idea like, Hey, I'm going to take the specs of everyone's bows and come up with this algorithm to, to, or this data chain to figure this all out. So that was Dave Williams and Isaac. And I got involved a little over a year ago and they called me up and said, Hey, we got a project if you're interested. And we got that part of it spun up and have evolved it ever since into making better and better products. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I know. I mean, even, even knock pinch, you know, you can, it's funny. Uh, I mean, arrows are important. Uh, all of it's important. Like you can call out one part and really focus on it, but it all needs to work together. Like you said, mm-hmm. a good example is, you know, knock a, a pinch knock, a one that gets, you, you get that sometimes if you hit it with an arrow or you step on it or something happens to the, the knock of an arrow and it gets pinched closed, that arrow will not shoot the same obviously right because it's Mm -hmm. coming off the string not as clean and part of our shot competition between jared and i i grabbed an arrow that i i don't know what i did to it but i almost shot a pinch knock and i don't even know what would have happened but can you imagine the asterisk that would have been next to your win had i shot a pinch knock you can come up with any excuse that you want (laughs) over the last few days but let's not have you tried just shooting better Yeah, yeah no well i mean that's that's what most do people better. might do. Do be better. better. Do better. Yeah, that's normally better. my recommendation is just shoot better. Well, and it's I mean, all that to say is is in all seriousness, um, and, and like you said, Ben, there's just it's a holistic thing in order to get proper flight. Is that what is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, if I take anything on this arrow that I'm holding up that you may or may not be able to see and make one part of it really bad, it's gonna cause problems. If I take this point that's 125 grains, but 200 grains up front, it's probably not going to fly well. And if I take the point off, shoot with no point, probably not going to fly too well. If I bend it a tiny bit, if I take this knock and I put it to one size too big on my string or one size too small, like you can really break your whole system by messing up anything. And by it might, you go with a little too little vein. Maybe it's not a huge difference. If you go with way too much, maybe it's not a huge difference, but it's one of those things where the whole system has to play together. And to look at just one factor of it, whether it's um, speed, mass, weight forward, or anything, you're going to end up with something that misses something else. Right. And when, when I met with, um, we talked with uh, the ranch ferry, one of the questions that I had, and I'm going to have it for you too, is, uh, is around like the swinging pendulum, right? And this is like human condition stuff. Problem happens, we get all upset and we swing one way. And we swing way too far inevitably. And it's happened in archery, right? For in the nineties, early two thousands, it was like super speed arrows, fast arrows, light arrows, fast bow, light bow, you know, just how much speed can you get out? The question I had for the ranch fair and have for you is, have we swung now too far the other way where it's like, let's shoot a log of an arrow. Um, and who cares about speed? Let's just shoot, you know, something with tons of momentum and just power through. Um, what do you, what's your take on that? So Really funny thing. Uh, yeah, you're way too far right of center on the weight thing most of the time because there's a lot happening. One, with an unrealistic expectation of what it takes to actually kill an animal. 
an unrealistic expectation of what a good arrow needs to look like because right. it's right now you have a false dichotomy where you can shoot 400 grains in a mechanical going 295 or five, five, 550 to 700 grains going 230 which i got a 32 and a half inch draw length i can shoot whatever i want right but for the, for all you normal people it's a little different because you, you're giving something up and then there's the happy medium that never gets talked about where you have an arrow that's equal that's sufficiently tuned that's moderate weight with moderate speed with a high quality component, durable carbon, and just is really smack in the middle. And that's where we're trying to be. We're not trying to be super light. We do have light options. If you're a young lady or a small guy where you're shooting 55, 60 pounds at 27 inches, you get a 420 grain arrow with Very an asterisk. Six, shooting 60 pounds, right? You're kind of a small guy. Yeah, no, I, I'm shooting 60 pounds at 32 and a half inches. Are you really? Jared, yeah. No, Jared, you're, you're doing what? No, you're doing 65, right? I should probably yeah. look at that. You are. It yeah. feels like 70. <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> Same here, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, but yes, yeah, so we're trying to stay kind of in that sweet spot where we can build you a 410 grain arrow, 420 grain with the asterisk of, hey, this may not perform well in these circumstances, but here's the next one up being Hammer V2, which we have coming on the line, and where it's going to be a little bit heavier and you're going to give up this circumstance. And really the goal is to create an educated consumer to where we can say, here's what seems to really matter for the successful endpoints you're looking for and here's your choices to get there yeah well and, and it's interesting you say i mean um this year i'm going with a lighter arrow than i had last year um a, a bit lighter I, i'm shooting the zmrs or the zoomers um which is zoomers. lighter and but i'm shooting them great um and i'm feeling good even though my, the, the arrows are flying great I'm, I'm having some issues still uh but uh, they're flying great and i'm excited to use them and so i've kind of taken a, a step back from maybe where I thought I would be a couple of years ago. I thought I'd stay heavy and, and big and I'm shooting a, a little bit lighter arrow and I am shooting mechanical this year. So. I mean, yeah, I'm shooting probably 480 to 500 grains this year. Yep. Uh, I'm going to have mechanicals and solids both in my quiver just because it seems that one mechanicals can be perfectly effective in the right situation. If you have realistic expectations and pick a good one, Right. Whereas a fixed blade, you get a good fixed blade and you're tuned, you're probably not going to have any issues. What mechanical are you running? Probably running. Run the, See, I the, just did it. Yeah, mm -hmm. either Severs or the G5 dead meats. I haven't decided yeah. yet. Yeah. I want to try both of those. I've shot the mega meats at a pig and yep. those were pretty gnarly. Yeah. I, I, we're running. I've got, I said it again, running. I'm using, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> got him. His uh, own evil. I know. I must be a dealer. Uh, I am using the med <laughs> mega meats, but those Severs, I've been, I've been eyeballing. They look pretty sweet. Yeah, I haven't messed with them yet. The titanium ferrules seem to make a lot of sense. They're a little shorter, so less leverage. Um, the yeah. dead meats and mega meats have a steel ferrule where they're also shorter, so a lot less leverage, which is a really big thing in mechanical, having that super long one. I got one over here that's probably two inches long, and that's just going to cost you bad, bad, bad times. Same reason you don't shoot a 200-grain single bevel that's like two and a half inches long. Right. Is you move that lever arm out front, you're just asking for durability and flight issues. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like some of those swackers had really long, they were real long. Yeah, that way too. that's actually what I was trying to grab. It's on one of the, oh, here you go. Swacker. Yep. Yep. Jared used to run one of those. No. You you did though, didn't you have a problem? Oh, yeah, I did. I yeah. did too. I, you know what? I liked it. I had. I never had a problem, but I switched away because the rubber bands, uh, I had one, I pulled it out of my quiver and that rubber band was like hanging on by a thread. And just that was like, I don't feel great about it. So, all right. So you're, you're saying basically you're, you're looking for a happy medium, uh, but we're, we're talking about arrows. I mean, is, th is that like, should, is that all you should be worrying about? Should you like, what else should you be looking for in order to get this like maximum penetration, best accuracy, best durability, all, all that stuff. So you can't really have one thing and have everything at the same time okay. as you get something that's going to have a little flatter trajectory which is important not just for your pin gaps which you don't like smoke a branch trying to arc something right. in there which if you shoot tack with a 240 feet per second arrow which i've done it's not fun because you just <laughs> hit all the branches right <laughs> but it's one of those things where you can have you can give up a little bit of penetration potential which the big point there though is the average person shooting 65 to 70 pounds from 28 inches to probably 30 inches yeah is going to have zero penetration issues assuming they shoot a very high quality fixed blade head and are well-tuned like those two big things are going to make a very big difference 
Now, yeah. don't go like like a white tail scapula, probably not giving you any problems. White tail ribs better not give you any problems. So once again, the bar is pretty low for what it takes to go through stuff. Yeah. So you can give up a little bit and still be in the safe spot. So kind of what we look for is if your arrow hits something and breaks, you're going to have a really bad day and it's just going to stop. So the front end needs to be durable enough and the carbon needs to be durable enough that if there is an impact with you hitting something heavy, if you go through it, that impact is significantly lessened, but you still got to be able to make up for that and go all the way. It go at least go far enough through to stop on the offside shoulder. So there's a little bit there where you really have to get the right. If you pick durable components, you're going to be heavy enough to probably solve most of your problems because it's really hard to get things that are light and durable. Interesting. Yeah. And, and it's funny, funny that you say that because just before this podcast, I was poking around on Instagram and it looks like you guys have fared well against that rhino, that Kafaru rhino, oh, yeah. the, the steel one. Oh yeah. So we built a 55 grand component, which is lighter than our lightest offering last year. Yeah. That is more durable than literally any of our offerings last year. And we use a more durable carbon. It's a lower modulus. It's going to give us a little thicker walls, which definitely help with durability. And that's the end result is you can shoot a steel plate with our titanium component. I got a one that I shot the aluminum component with and it broke because it was aluminum, but it also weighs 30 grains. So I got lighter and I lost a little bit of strength. By the way, on concrete, this does fine. Not steel though. Concrete's easy to go through because yeah. um, it will stick into it or break it. Yeah. But so you got to eventually find that happy medium of isolating these confounding factors where if you shoot a lightweight component and it breaks every time, and then you go to a heavier one, is it the mass or the not breaking? Well, something we've kind of seen through our testing with these is if you don't break and you're really anywhere between 440 to 550 grains, you're probably doing okay, assuming you're shooting a good fixed blade head. And that's just, we need a durable carbon, we need a durable component, we need a durable fixed blade head. If you shoot a mechanical, maybe be a little more picky with your shot angles, or maybe you're like me and have long arms and are shooting anywhere from 60 to 75 pounds. Like my engineer, Brad shooting 75 pounds and he's got a 32 inch draw. So, so he's got some speed. Yeah, some power I mean, I've, behind it. yeah. I've shot 83 pounds with a 600 grain arrow going almost 300 feet per second. Really? Yeah. So <laughs> that must be nice. That would be sweet. Actually. It, it's, it's really hard to get stuff to tune. Is it? It's really, really hard. Yeah. Anytime your carbon gets that long and you go that fast, you really have to add some weight to slow that down, which is another thing. Um, as you get going really fast, you kind of want to bottom that speed down. No, not really any faster than 285 because things get kind of squirrely. Why is that? It just goes really fast. It just moves so fast, hard to control. Uh, I, I think that's part of it. But also the fact is, is you're kind of magnifying any issues with your tune the faster you go. Sure. And you're, you're not really worried about, I mean, do you worry about the, the archers, the archers paradox we've talked about before? Is that, is that so much of an issue? Uh, it's like when I shot a recurve, when I shoot my recurve, that's, that's a big thing, getting that arrow to flex around the, the riser and, and shoot straight. I mean, is that, is that an issue for, for compound? Yeah, so if you're trying to get your arrow to arch around your rest, your bow's out of tune. What do you mean by that? So ideally, your arrow and your knock should be traveling in a straight line along, along your arrow rest the entire power stroke of the bow. If it is having to compress and flex because it's a non-uniform cylinder and it bows out to the side, or up or down or whatever, normally it's up or down, but yeah. in trying to oscillate around that rest, then your rest is in the wrong place. The reason you shoot a stiff spine is because your rest is in the proper position in relation to your string and it just pushes it straight. Straight through. Yes. So if you're having to paradox around your compound bow, which is a modern tool that is incredibly adjustable to the shooter, yeah, then you probably should just adjust it to the shooter. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense because it's like, one, you're shooting off the shelf, right? And one, you've got a, a totally separate um, rest that basically allows it to go straight. You don't have to worry about any of that flexing. Am I, am I understanding that right? Yeah, and you can shim cams. I mean, when an arrow tins too weak, you have excessive flex. And minimizing sure. your flex, and flex requires energy to make that flex. So if you can not flex, you're going to retain some energy. And then the faster it recovers going out of the bow, you're retaining energy, which not a ton. Like the bigger difference is the downrange flight. But sure. keeping that uh, arrow stiff so that it just travels straight through is going to give you a lot better performance downrange. Yeah, right. Because you're flying straight. You keep that momentum, that energy kind of moving forward, not side to side or up and down. Probably helps with accuracy too. Yeah. I mean, if you, like for me, if I tune weak with my arrows, which is really easy to do because they're so long, uh, I get a left tail kick off the shot. Interesting. Like I, it's visible. I can see it. If I shoot at 50 yards, it's like, okay, 
back th- like I've been able to sit there, shoot a broadhead and have a left tail kick and them not fly well, back a turn out of limb bolts. All right, cool. So sorry, this is I'm jumping around here, but I mean this is there's a lot, right? Oh yeah. You're there's a lot to this. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh I mean, so a couple things that you know before we get into more arrow stuff, you we you brought up air bow tune, like your bow is out of tune if you have to worry about it. Like the <laughs> I mean, that's, and Jared and I've been talking about this as you've kind of set up your own um, archery station there at your house there, Jared, but like Mm -hmm. bow tuning is important and, and bow tune is important for the bow, but it's also like, you can't really tune a bow unless you have proper form anyways. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this all of a sudden it goes from the arrow to the bow to the person, which makes this, um, this issue a lot bigger than, than simply a, a one issue thing. You know, the issue of penetration or lethality with an arrow is a lot bigger than just the arrow, right? There's a lot happening there. And you can take a compound bow off a shelf, take an arrow, load up the point, wait till it tunes. So essentially, you're recurve tuning a compound, which I have a recurve hanging on my wall. It's not yeah. in terribly difficult to do, and it works great. I've done it with a compound before. It's totally doable, but you're losing the efficiency and benefits of your compound bow. And form... I can take someone and say, hold your bow like you're trying to choke somebody versus holding your bow with proper neutral grip with decent heel pressure and your knuckles at around 45 degrees. Yeah. And they're going to have a significantly different tear through paper and a bear shaft's going to apply different. And one's repeatable, one's not. You can take a guy that I actually have a customer I'm working with right now that he sent me a picture. I cannot get rid of this knock right tear, right-handed shooter, man, your draw length short, sends me a picture and his bow arm's bent, his shoulder's shrugged up. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's th- there's a ton of right ways to get your stuff set up and your bow set up, but there are also definite wrong ways. Yeah. So like it's important that you have good form or at least repeatable form. Cause even if you're wrong and you do the same thing every time, you can get it to tune. But good repeatable form is good form is the one that lends itself to being repeatable. Yeah. And there's also like if you go through like the school of knock with John Dudley or whatever, it's a great basis and probably a really good resource for most people that's a great starting point. It also makes sense to try and mimic people who are successful. So there's kind of like a middle ground you have to find where what you do also is something that lends itself being easily repeatable is also something that has shown it to be possible to be successful. Right. Yeah. And it's funny how that that's worked. Um, you know, we, we've talked on here a lot, you know, I, I shot trad for like exclusively for three years, switch back to compound and my form was kind of weird. Like it, I, I I had a, a tendency to twist the to can, uh, not twist the bow yeah twist the bow not cant the bow almost like twist it out um, and so when I switched back I was having trouble tuning it because I was the, I was the issue the bow was actually bow was tuned right the arrow was right it was me that was creating a problem which was like you know like crap I gotta figure that out now you know yeah there's um, a lot there to it and. If you, a really good thing you can do is if you have a good shop or a good range you go to that lets you shoot through paper or something and you can't get your bow to tune, hand it to someone else. Yeah. Because people shoot other people's bows different than their own and they're probably going to hold it properly. It's, if they normally have good form, they're going to hold it right and it'll probably be a little more neutral than where you're used to shooting. Interesting. You don't have all the muscle memory built into it. Yeah, it's just another troubleshooting step. You know, if you can't figure it out, have someone else shoot it and then you can narrow it down. Like, is it the bow? Is it the shooter? Because if it starts act, if it's acting up for both of you, yeah. And and there's there's right. nothing wrong with shimming your cams to fit you. I mean, for me, like if my if, there, if I, I've had a bow that just only goes to 32 inches and I've got the tables all twisted up and a long D loop and I have to tune it a little differently just to make it fit me, but I'm still adjusting the mechanisms inside the bow to do that. I'm still going to shim the cams and move the rest and get that power stroke lined up properly. And then normally my arrow will tune after the fact, or maybe I say, hey, I'm shooting a bow that's way too short. I'm going to have to be out of spec on something. Am I going to be underspined on my arrow to make that happen? Am I going to have my rest way out of spec or where am I going to do that? So it's one of those things where it's, you can't take any one piece out of it and say, this is the thing, right? It's the whole thing has to work together. Holistic. I mean, well, I guess now I just need to get you out to Michigan to tune me and Jared's bow for us. Let's do it. Uh, that'd be fun. I've tried. It is so, ch- it's a knowledge base that I just don't have yet. So I set up my bow all by myself. Yeah, thank you. Cookie points. <laughs> nice. Let's go. Get some. And, there we go. Uh, good start. I felt real good about it. You know, I brought it out to the paper, shot it through, tail low, right? Tail low and a little bit left. So, you know, they say follow the tear. So I did all this stuff. Still getting a tear low. So I'm like dropping my rest. I'm moving my knock point up. It's like everything says. Still a little bit like knock low or tear low. 
I'm like, what the heck? And finally, I don't know if I was in the right stance and just had the right grip and everything, but it shot perfectly. Just one little time. I was like, sweet, good to go. <laughs> so then I start sighting it in. Good enough. Good enough. One and done. And I can only get out to like 60 yards right now without, without my fletchings touch, touching the top of my site housing. The bottom. Yeah. 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 The bottom. Did I say top? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I totally meant bottom. Top of the arrow. Yeah, that might crazy. be a part of your issue actually, if you're hitting the top of it. Right. No, no, that'd be huge. You're like what the heck? I'm going to shred everything off. What does he James, do, Ben? Uh, flip the side over. That's a good start. He, James doesn't get it. He's really? very confused. Really? Um, you, I don't a, get joke. it. It was a joke, dude. I'm not following. Okay, not so if, he's hitting, if he's hitting the top of his sight with his arrow. Boom. Oh, I get it. Yeah. We have a big problem. All right. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's anyway. not allowed to do podcasts. <laughs> uh, you yeah. really didn't get that though. No, I was slow. I was trying to figure well, I'm very I'm like trying to learn, Jared. I'm not here to I am too. Around. I'm absorbing just a ton of knowledge right now. So if I'm quiet, it like I said, there's steam coming out of my ears right now. Yeah. Um okay, we're gonna come back to that, but I have a question about this now. <clears throat> so say you, you you've worked out your um your form and you're you're getting a good tear, you got the good arrow, like how much I don't know. You, you hear all about like how much kinetic energy you need, how much force you need to for a, a kill shot. There's calculators online and all that. Like, what what do you actually need? What, what's actually the the amount of force you need to uh, actually be lethal on something, maybe like a deer? So we spent a lot of time and did a lot of math and ran a lot of numbers and finally came to a, a pretty conclusive answer. And it depends. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> yeah. So. Really, if you go purely off momentum, then that's a, not a very good measurement because something like a 380 grain arrow going 300 feet per second has 0.51 slugs of momentum, which is an incredibly light arrow. And they go really, really fast. And people are like, okay, that's going to bounce off an animal. We've all heard that. And yeah, it very well might. And anytime you get a projectile going really fast that hits an animal like that, the animal itself is going to behave closer to a solid and take more force to penetrate because it's essentially somewhat elastic and you do have to deal with like the shear rate and this is stuff my engineer explained to me and I'm not doing a very good job representing, but it behaves more like a solid the faster it goes. So you as you go great. faster, you get an increase in forces required to penetrate. So a slow arrow is going to take less force at a amount that I really don't have a good number to say than something going faster, depending on how much faster it goes. And then you have to factor in something like, what are you hitting? Cause if you hit nothing, just like ribs, yeah, just like go for it. You're fine. Yeah. You hit a shoulder blade on a white tail, probably not a big deal. You hit like the thick part of the shoulder blade, a little bit bigger deal. And then you like, you try to go to the onside hip bone. That's a pretty big deal. Right. So it, it really just depends what you hit. And the really the best recommendation we can make is shoot an arrow that's, you're going to shoot the most, excuse me, the most accurate. Shoot the best broadhead you can afford and make sure your setup is tuned and you're an accurate archer. Uh, a good example of this is my girlfriend shoots lights out. She's a better shot than I am. And it really bothers me, but she was shooting 55 pounds at 27 and a half inches with a 412 grain arrow. Okay. And she's yeah. shooting an iron wheel wide and can cut through the hip bones of white tails. Sure. So kind of throws the whole, it throws a lot of the arguments out the window when you start looking at cases like that. Whereas someone like myself, I mean, I've shot a 780 grain arrow at the white tail last year, went through the onside shoulder and stopped on the offside. Whereas this year, I mean, you're I 32 shot, inch draw. You're shooting a heavy that was arrow. Shooting, that was shooting 73 pounds. And that was 73 before I put pounds. 80 pound lens on. Yeah. But it was a really crappy broadhead. The edge rolled like crazy. It couldn't cut butter when it came out of it. And then this year I shot my spike bull um, frontal at like 10 yards with shooting 50 pounds at 32 and a half inches and cut lengthwise to the onside scapula went out the offside hip. You shot, uh, what was it a recurve or like a compound? 50 compound. Pounds. Yeah. Cause I had really? shoulder surgery this time last year really interesting yeah. so it's one of those things where just what you hit deter determines the amount of energy needed how fast you're going is going to change the amount of energy needed and what's on the front of your arrow like i'm still a, what i'm not a low energy shooter but i'm still not super confident and if i had a steep quarter and two angle shooting a mechanical at it even right. though i am shooting a 490 grain arrow or whatever but with it, something like an iron wheel wide which is what i've probably been shooting 90 percent of the time since that's i 
shoot, take any shot angle with that because I know that play is going to be sharp enough to cut through a bone, not just break through it, cut through it. And it's going to have significantly lower force requirements, whereas something like a mechanical going really fast might take a little more force to open, a little more force to cut, or even just a less efficient broadhead. Yeah. So there, there really is no good answer for what does it take. It's optimize your setup and acknowledge the fact that doing one thing somewhere can make you need more or less somewhere else. So if you're me shooting 60 pounds at 32 and a half inches, you know what? Shoot a mechanical at any white tail you want. Right. If, what are you, you're pulling 70 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, I shoot a mechanical at any white tail you want. I know your arrow is like 460 grains. Yep. That's, people will call that a heavy arrow, but it's a moderate weight arrow. It's awesome. Kill. You're going to do fine. Um, Jared, what are you shooting? Uh, 70 pounds, 125. Oh, go grain for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, doesn't grain. matter. You're, you're fine. Shoot, shoot anything you pretty much want to. Just make sure it's sharp and tunes well. Right. Perfect. So you, you mentioned good or bad broadheads. Yeah. What makes a good or a bad broadhead? A lot of stuff. So um, anything from the steel used, something I brought up iron will bring them up again. Their A2 is phenomenal. It's incredibly sharp. It stays sharp for a long time. And they're short. They're not very long. If you're going to have surface yep. area on your broadhead, have it be width. So at least you get a larger cutting surface. If you're going to have a long broadhead, it's going to affect your tune in a negative way because it's more surface area and you're not getting any benefit. And also as you get longer without increasing your cut, as that edge dulls, you're going to have less forces acting on your edge, which when people talk about mechanical advantage, they don't entirely understand that on a broadhead because what it's actually telling you is the amount of forces acting on it because it's not wedging, it's cutting. Right. So as you get steeper, you're actually going to cut more tissues and wear your edge faster. But if your edge holds up, you're okay because it's a wider thing and you have more forces acting on it. And as that blade begins to dull, rather than the tissues slide off because it's a less efficient plane or a less efficient wedge, so to yeah. speak, you're going to actually cut those because it puts more forces on them. So Interesting. good broadhead design. It's going to be durable. It's going to need to stay sharp. It's going to need to take an edge well and not break. A QAD Exodus is another great one. Those are really short. The blades aren't really long. It's got a fairly steep blade angle, but they're incredibly sharp and they're yeah. fairly thin. So they do take an edge well. Well, that's not why they take an edge well, but they are fairly thin. They don't, don't seem to break a lot. So yeah. That's a great one. It's short. Um, they're four. That's a four blade, right? It's a three blade. I'm pretty sure. Three blade. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you're just kind of looking for what's the thing that's going to give me the least amount of problems with flight but the greatest amount of lacerations because at the end of the day, it's not really penetration that kills anything. It's going to be the lacerations. And we do have a broadhead. It's S7 tool steel. Uh, we're going with that because it's incredibly impact resistant. It's not going to take as good of an edge as something like an A2 would. Um, I mean, you can look, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. But we did swoop the edges out because it's going to let us cut a little bit longer with the design that we went with, with the steel that we're going to be going with, because for us, the important thing was we wanted a little bit of extra. We wanted something that we could get good. And that was something right. we found that we could get good. And it seems we're, so far, it's been pretty promising. Another really, really good broadhead. Um, forgetting the name of it right now. Um, What's it look like? Three blade, single bubble? Three blade. Annihilator? Stubby, annihilators, yeah. Nice, Cups are yeah. kind of weird, but they're cool. I mean, they're short, stubby. They fly awesome. Everyone likes them. Right. It's just one of those things where when you pick your broadhead, you can have lots of cutting or something that flies really well. Don't give up any, don't give up something, don't give up flight without getting more cutting surface. Don't give up cutting surface without getting improvements in flight. Right. So um, I'm headed out to hunt caribou long shots, yeah. you know, but relatively thin skinned air, uh, animal, uh, as they say, like it, they don't take a, they don't take an arrow well. Uh, Am I, should I be thinking, you know, they're long shots. So, uh, I need something that'll fly well. Uh, should I be looking at, uh, like, a mechanical, should I be looking at something like a fixed blade? If I was going, I'd be breaking, I, I'm, I will hunt my entire season this year with both in my quiver. Okay. Because for me, if I have an elk at nine yards frontal, I'm going to shoot it. Right. Probably not with a mechanical though. No. But if it's at 68 yards bugling his head off, yeah, we're going to send it. With yeah you're gonna go full send All right. oh yeah so it's just one of those things where the situation would dictate it now if you know you're taking a long shot on a caribou if it's like a haul road hunt yes where that's you're what not it is getting... oh yeah i mean if you're comfortable with a mechanical and you have one you like um the dead meats I... you said you should mega meats yeah you know, i had meats. last year yep yeah i mean i would sh... i like the small arm mechanicals because they're still massive because i do feel like they're get it's not really a energy thing for me because 
you know, long arms, but it's right. more of a durability thing. So it's just one of those things where if that's what you're comfortable with and that's what you're confident with and you're say, you know what, I'm shooting a mechanical, probably shouldn't try and go through that onside shoulder knuckle. Then there's really no reason not to shoot one because you've said, okay, that's my limitation. If I shoot the onside shoulder knuckle and it goes really poorly, the mechanical did exactly what mechanicals are supposed to do. Right. That was not a failure on anything other than the person shooting it. Than me. Yeah. And that's something that we're all really bad with is we have all these equipment failures and it's like, did, were you reasonable with your, with your expectations? It's like, if you're shooting an 800 grand arrow and you shoot under something, done it at least once. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's not really an 800 grand arrow's fault. It's really heavy and slow. It would have gone zip right through it unreasonably so, but beside the point, it was an unrealistic <laughs> expectation of my equipment. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, and I, you hear it a lot where it's like, oh, you know, ah, man, you know, something's wrong with my fletching or my, my arrow is not quite right or, or whatever. But like at the end of the day, most of the time, uh, it's, it's the guy shooting the bow. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned you're coming out the broadhead system. When is that yep. going live? When's that happening? Oh, I have no idea. A while yet? <laughs> yeah, development's been a bit, been uh, very difficult. How come? It's hard. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> it's hard it's just not easy it's not and you don't want to come out with something that's crappy yeah no we have to use all the stuff we make like the arrows i shoot come out of the calculator the only arrow that i've shot this year that didn't come out of the calculator was for this the tack in tennessee i just did a science experiment to see if i matched weight between two spines so I went to a stiffer spine with lower point weight yeah if there'd be any difference in flight because we were testing how stiff is too stiff turns out it flies awesome it's like four inches higher at 80 yards and it's more durable because it has a hundred grain tip, which is a little bit less leverage. Interesting. Yeah. It's completely blew my mind, but no, we have, we use the stuff that we make. So I don't want to build anything that sucks. Cause then I have to use it. <laughs> That's true. You don't want to go out there with crap. No, I mean, I'm not going to do it. I shouldn't expect anyone else to do it. I went to the um, uh, shop, had my bow tuned. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, quite on the level that Jared is where he's, tuning my own stuff yes sir um and i had 100 grain points and they actually were tuning the same as 125 points um i elected to go 125 points is there any reason i should have stayed with 100 grain tips instead if there's a 100 grain broadhead you like more that's really it yeah that, that's the only thing i think of like our field points, the 100 grain is a little bit shorter than the 125. So like yeah. if you hit a side impact, you just get a little shorter lever arm. But like, that's me shooting at a piece of steel to see what happens. Right. That's not, that's not realistic. No. So like, just pick a 100 or a 125 grain point. Don't go with crazy 150, 200 grain numbers because the fact that I lose stuff all the time and I've had to go to archery shops when I'm out West yeah. trying to find a 200 grain broadhead will not happen. Go shoot 100s or 125. So if you have to, you can shoot anything you need to. And yeah. also there's the field points are shorter and it'll be a little easier in your components. So that's why I like it. Cause you don't break as much stuff. Right. But that's a big thing is get a broadhead. You're going to, that's, it's good. Like don't have confidence in a bad one and then have, find a good broadhead that you have confidence in and then just go shoot that. Don't overthink it. Okay. If 25 grains is going to change your life. How something went wrong way down. <laughs> okay. That's kind of where my head was at. It's like, how important are these 25 grains? Cause sometimes I've had it where like, uh, I forgot what I was reading, but it's like the, I, the difference between a couple grains here and there actually doesn't make as much of a difference as, as people seem to think. I hunted last year with like 16 grains difference because I had two different prototype components. Right. And they, at 85 yards, I had a six inch gap. Really? Okay. With those uh, broadheads, yeah. Because one broadhead was a big wide one, the other was a lot smaller, and the bigger, wider broadhead had slowed down a little bit more to where it kind of collapsed that. With field tips, it was a little different, but that's better than I could shoot at 85 yards. I right. Just, yeah, it was, they, they were all on the target at 85 yards. It was like one of those little bitty tiny ones. So I was just thrilled. Yeah. You're fine with that. Oh yeah. Um, so you mentioned components. Yeah. I, we've talked about, you know, the, the, the arrow shaft itself we talked about the, the broadhead, but another really important part of, are the components that go into it. Right. Yeah. Cause if your components bend when it hits something hard and the impact on something like a bone, it, it, it's an impact. It's still, even though it does eventually deform and let the arrow go through, unless it just stops, if it stops and you have different issues, but right. it hits it. Once it reaches enough work being done, it goes through. If at any point in time, your component fails during that process and that energy is being used up and breaking your component. And that's really not ideal. 
So what you need to do is you need to have a component that when it hits something hard, like the backside of a scapula, yeah. which is so, so hard, but still hard, or maybe it hits a leg bone and you just go through yeah. it because you're shooting 75 pounds, whatever. Mm -hmm. You need it to not deform. You need to not break. And you also can't have your carbon break. And honestly, I love picking up arrows after they go through stuff and being able to use them. Like at tech, I smoked so many trees and I like would spend 10 minutes finding an arrow and be fine. So that yeah. was nice. Yeah, that is nice. I, yeah. I shot one into a, a brick wall. It went through my target, like, you know, some weak spot. And it went into a brick wall behind it because I've been shooting in the gym of an old uh, abandoned school building. Long story there. Oh, it sounds great. Yeah, it's it looks like a horror movie inside. And I don't go in there at dark because I'm pretty sure it's haunted. But during the daytime when I'm practicing in there, I shot through it, literally went in the brick, kind of burrowed in, pulled it right out, kind of gave it the old flex test to see if everything was OK. Totally fine. Shot fine. Yeah, Just, that's nice. I mean, it's really nice. Now you hit an animal and you go through it. It's not that that offside impact is not going to have as much force if you just smoked a brick wall. Right. So the force requirements are lower, but it's still nice to know, okay, I am prepared for a way outside of left field scenario that is never going to be impacted during any hunting scenario. Right. So it's that, that's kind of was our goal with our component redesign. Use a little bit better materials, get everything up there. One piece. Uh, Oh, yeah, so there's a bit of a false sense of security people get from one piece things. If you have a really well designed two piece component, then it can be just as good as a one piece component or even better depending on what you're trying to use it for. Yeah, it's like just if you have a not great two piece component it's of course going to be worse than a really good one piece component. For everybody who's listening, and if you don't know what a component, what, what components are that we're talking about, it's the thing that connects your arrow to your broadhead or field point. Like it's that metal piece of Threading. component. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Am I getting that right, Ben? Is there, is there, yeah, that's pretty much anything? what it is. We would call it an insert, but it goes on the outside. So we don't call it an insert because that's confusing. called an outsert. I want to call it an oversert, but that got vetoed. Yeah. They didn't like that. I'll fold. No. Why yeah. is that? They're a bunch of haters. A bunch of haters, man. <laughs> They're stifling your create your creativity and it's crap. Yeah, it's I know. It's horrible. Bull crap. <laughs> um, all right. So let's just like zoom out a minute. You know, we got into technical things. Um, but say, say you're, you're a guy that wants just like, wants to build good arrows, right? He wants to, he wants to build just like lethal arrows that he or she can take out to the woods and, and be, be deadly with. So what should their goals be when they're building an arrow? So I would say don't build them, go buy them from us. But that's just because I have to say that. <laughs> yeah, fair. Really, I would just say go pick a moderate weight carbon. Um, I've shot some stuff from Black Eagle and Easton and a couple others, gold tips also. Durable carbons that are all mid-weight. They're all good options. Get a good straightness or if you don't buy the higher straightness and just make sure they're straight either on a spine tester or Noctune or whatever. Yeah. Um, then go, get a, go find a component that you know is going to be durable, whether it's the stock one or whatever, that if you do have a hard impact, you're not going to break it. And then go to the, go to the spine chart for that respective arrow and say, okay, I'm 70 pounds at 28 inches. And I have 125 point with my whatever grain component. I'm a 300 spine or whatever cut to 28 inches. Get yeah. a properly spined arrow. Say, okay, how much veins do I need on the back? Well, most people probably can do a high profile three fletch or a medium profile four fletch with a little bit of a helical. Mm -hmm. Don't really recommend straight fletching anymore. We found out that there really just isn't that huge benefit there that we expected with sound. Interesting. Because the, the, the question there was with the helical, you you have a little sound of it, whoosh, wishing through the air, kind of that, that noise. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a little bit of a whoosh. And then I shot a vented broadhead and it was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the vented broadhead is, is really what loud. makes the noise. I had one yeah. that whistled. I bought oh, yeah. these ones, they're crappy and they... Yeah, we, had, we made some prototype. well, prototypes in our broadhead and I got one here that was vented and I wanted to call it the whistler, but I had also got overruled. <laughs> that's fair. It's not great I mean, marketing. <laughs> it, it, everyone knows they whistle. It's like, they whistle. To. that's, that's how venting works. It's not bad. It's just like, it's a consequence of being vented. That's how whistles work. Exactly. Like yeah. we built a whistler. It sounds cool. Let's just own it. Yeah. And they didn't like that idea either. <laughs> so just think it's a bird flying at them. Yeah. I mean, there's exactly. Thank you. So back speaking to where of we which, were. speaking of which, sorry, one side note, uh, we, th this is a total side note, but I thought it was funny. We, we have started to post on TikTok. Okay. We, we joined the youths and are posting I was there partially against it. 
Well, it's mostly videos of Jared dancing in low cut shirts. Uh, but we Wait, so we got, in, we got in trouble sometimes <laughs> oh. for you, you put a kill shot or a dead animal, and they they get really mad about it. And mm-hmm. so they did. Like I wasn't posting for a while. Um, the other the third member of the Fair Chase, Tom, was. So I'm like, oh, let me try some. Let me try. So I did it, and I didn't know he got in trouble. So, anyways, I, we did it. We got like kind of like semi banned for a while, whatever. But what this reminds me of is the way that people get around it. They keep they'll show a picture of you of a guy shooting a lighted knock at a deer, and just say, "Look at this uh, firefly that scared these deer away," because it looks like a firefly <laughs> flying at him, and then they don't get in trouble. And so I might start doing that. We got to throw some lighted knocks on the back of our arrow steer so we can post more on, on TikTok. And not Fireflies? Fireflies scaring away deer, you know? Anyways, that, that, so, I don't know, that didn't That's actually anything. a great segue to building yeah. your arrow is when you're at, after you've got picked your fletchings and you're moving over to your knocks, if you do shoot a lighted knock, be very careful with your lighted knock selection because a longer knock is going to flex a little bit more. Okay. And there are some lighted knocks that are really long, like the ones that have the adapters to fit micros. Yeah. Specifically talking about ours, like when you get to a five mil or the two or the two four fours, it's not a really a big deal at all. You can get away with a lot, but the ones that really put your knock groove really far off your carbon. Yeah. Those are not so great. They can induce a little bit of flex and kind of exacerbate some issues that you don't want to have. Interesting. And they, yeah, I, I did the whole lighted knock things for a while. They weigh different. They're a different weight in the back end, which again, a couple of grains here and there might not matter that much, but they were not durable. Like they broke that's, a lot. That's the big concern that I have. And I've, there was a very, very durable micro knock that I found that wasn't a fire knock because they're just really expensive and a pain in the next install. Yeah. I'd probably shoot them, but right now I'm just haven't found any that I'm okay with taking around. I got a couple of elk tags this year. And I don't see myself beating the crap out of any knock for four or five weeks. And right them still being there if they're lit yeah exactly exactly so you've got we, we we've gotten shaft we've gotten uh back end what else you know for this perfect arrow that we're talking here uh go get your go get your bow tuned to you shooting it don't just go take it to a shop hand it to them and say paper tune go have them right. tune it to you shooting it and go to a shop to where if you're torquing the crap out of it they're going to say hey turn your grip a little bit or if you're punching the crap out of your trigger, they're going to say, try to execute that release with some back tension, or at least provide some feedback to where it's going to result in a more consistent shot. Yeah. And then go shop around for a broadhead. And maybe if you want to shoot a mechanical, you say, okay, maybe it's a good idea. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not a great idea for you as a shooter. Or then you look at fixed heads and maybe you say, okay, I have the excess. I have the money where I can go buy something like an iron wheel, which is probably hands down the best broadhead ever made. Or maybe mm-hmm. I say, you know what? I don't, what's my better budget options. You have something like a Q80 that's phenomenal that you can go shoot. And then you, okay, you got all that figured out. Now you got to go practice. You got to make sure you're both set up, right? Maybe you are someone who's never shot past 40 yards and you're trying to stretch out. Now you got to learn how to shoot that. You got to learn how to do all this stuff. And then you got to like, make sure you're actually getting in front of an animal. So it's really a very small piece of the puzzle. Yeah, a lot goes to it. It's a, it's a lot. And if any, once again, like if you skip step one, you don't go get your bow tuned. Well, good luck. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's not going to go well. Right. Or maybe like my buddy Ethan Eskey did, you get a bunch of lighted knocks, you get back from the truck after a day of hiking, and all your knocks are broke. Good luck trying to shoot something then. Yeah, all of his lit knocks. And I'm not going to say the brand because that's not nice. Um, <laughs> or maybe you picked a broadhead that's just not very good or doesn't fly very forgivingly and you just completely miss you smoke a branch because you sit beside the air on the side of extra mass or yeah. just like there's a lot that goes into this and it's not great to oversimplify it. Yeah. Well, a big, it's a big picture and there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, and we've tried to cover that over the last couple of years, um, just talking to different people about different components of the bow, different tuning and so on. I'm hoping to get Joe, Joel, Joel Turner on here pretty soon. To oh, fix I love that guy. He needs to fix my, uh, target panic it helped me a lot it really did <laughs> did it oh yeah i mean just something i mean i always i shot growing up always had a shot process but never actually had one where the shot activation was something you focused on because all your shit focusing on the shot shot activation yeah yeah i so, need help with that because like yeah. I'll, I'll i'll beat it or i'll feel like i'm fine and i went into attack feeling fine well the minute you get out there with a bunch of guys <laughs> looking at you yeah. you know what i'm saying like you're First sitting target. You're sitting out there and you're like, people are looking at you and it's like, oh man, it's really hard to move my pin onto the thing I want to hit. I can't, I'm stuck away from yeah. it, you know? Oh yeah. No, I, 
it, it helps a lot. I mean, even something like a resistance release has helped, but really just the shot process was what kind of did it for me. Yeah. Now well, we got to get him on. Um, so you got some Alcons coming up. Where are you headed? Uh, Colorado and Montana. Nice. Yeah. And hopefully not get eaten by grizzly bear. Where are you going to the, okay. What part of Montana? <sighs> like Southwest corner. Okay. Yeah. I, I, fl- I just got done bear hunting in. I, we took bows. We flew into Bozeman and kind of cruised up the West side of the state. Kind of, uh, kind yeah, of, we went to, we were over to salmon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. we, yeah. We flew into Bozeman and met a buddy up and then drove over into like an hour or so north of salmon. Yep. Okay. So sure. It, I know it was like is. super wet and cold and rainy and just awful. Yeah. Like but no also kind of awesome. Oh, was, I can't wait to go back. Yeah. The, the best. <laughs> Do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, Hey, we're coming up on time. Um, you know, we, we always do this at the end of a podcast. People might know, but just a refresher, like if they want to learn more about, you know, vector arrows or maybe even just arrow builds or, or how things like this work, which they do, how do they get a hold of you guys and get more information? For any kind of technical questions or customer support, shoot an email over to info at vectorcustomshop.com. And if you want to know what we're doing or check out any products, go to vectorarrows.com or vectorarrows on Instagram. And that's going to be the best way to get a hold of us through any of those channels. Excellent. Well, Ben, thank awesome. you very much for the time. Um, like I said, I appreciate you coming on and just, we, we, we started touching on arrows. We, we got some information there and, you know, we, we, there's just a lot more to cover. And, and so we appreciate you coming on and uh, kind of talking through it. Yeah. We only got through like half a page of the three and a half page outlines <laughs> I, <know>. I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I sent well, that have... over and I sent it to Isaac and he was like, you do know they only do it for an hour, right? And I was like, <laughs> oh, We'll do this again. Any anytime you want. Honestly, please, please just drive out to Michigan and tune our bows for us and make it make everything right. Yeah, fix it. Dude. Can you just you fix told, it for us? You're done. You, you're sold. Yeah, give me a ticket. If if you were asked like, hey, want to come shoot tack and just show up with a bow press, we'd do it. Dang it. That's like it's all you had to have done. Jared, this is on you, man. I don't yeah, know why, but it, like, I feel like this is your drop. I'm taking this personally. <laughs> you should. You really should. Jared, you got something to say for yourself? My bad, man that's right i don't forgive you <laughs> <All right>, <laughs> well, <laughs> well thank you very much we'll um i hope everybody enjoyed like i said if you have questions shoot him message shoot us a message we'll make sure to, to get you looped through um and we'll look forward to talking again next week